today's weed of the month is Dallas grass. I have a big clump of it with me. The scientific name is Pasphalum dilatatum. Dallas grass has three lookalikes. This is the third in a series of grassy weeds common in the southeast that people have a hard time distinguishing from each other. I certainly did the first time I was studying them, but you will begin to recognize them at a glance when you're out on your walks and even when you're driving by. Um, you might become like me and start shouting out weeds when we're going out to dinner. Um, people really don't know how to respond to that, but um, it's, it's a fun thing. It's a fun game to play. But today, Dallas grass has some unique ID features and also some challenges with eradicating. So we're going to launch into both of them right now. For every weed of the month, we talk about how the clue, some clues about the plant are in the name. The scientific name is Paspalum dilatatum. Paspalum is from the ancient Greek word. It's not a modern Greek word, apparently. I don't know Greek though, but paspalos, meaning millet. That tells you something about this plant. This plant, Dallas grass, is related to other edible millets. I cannot determine if this plant is edible or not. I don't think it is. It is definitely a forage plant. And that gets into the, sign, the common name, Dallas grass. It is named colloquial, colloquially after farmer A.T. Dallas, who grew a lot of paspalum dilatatum. They called it more commonly water grass or water paspalum is another common name, but it has been named after him for reasons I was not able to determine. He was a, a livestock, he grew lots of livestock and grew this grass for them. And it is, the common name honors that. The second part of the name, so we talked about paspalum being from paspalos, meaning millet. And a little aside about millets, there are dozens of millets and they span different genera. So we talked last week about finger millet and this is another common name, millet, related to all those different genuses or genera that are edible. We talked about the common name being water grass or water paspalum. It tells you where this plant grows. It loves wet areas. It loves low-lying areas. It loves ditches. You will commonly find it in lower areas of fields, of um, crop, crop fields, and also um, infesting rice crops because of that, that standing water they grow in. This adapts well to. So I read. I have never actually seen a rice field. So that's one of those things I've just read about and I'm passing on to you. I'm going to talk a little bit about the habit of this plant. And, you know, I missed over the dilatatum part, and I might have done that Freudianly because I don't know much about it. Dilatatum means dilated or expanded or spreading. I was not able to figure out what exactly botanically that refers to, whether it's part of the seed or something you look up under the microscope or whether it grows, certainly does grow in large um, spreading clumps. But I don't want to make anything up. I hope if someone who does know would ever comment on the, in the comments section on YouTube about that, I would love to learn from you. Talking about the habit, it is a clump former. It is a clump former, but it also sends out rhizomes that spread in smaller clump. They are short rhizomes. They're not the couple foot long rhizomes that you'd see on Bermuda grass. They're um, Donna, will you call up the habit? I think that will just explain everything. That is a clump of Dallas grass. It starts as a clump, like what I was holding in my hand here, and then it spreads out with these short rhizomes and it forms kind of an, a volcano look. Greg pointed out last month that it's very distinctive in that the lawn will then colonize back into the center of that, that Dallas grass. That's a picture of a Bermuda lawn. Zoysia lawns will also do it. Any, any colonizing lawn will grow back in there. And that's a typical habit you'll see. So if we want to go back to the clump I have here in my hand. <laughs> um, so I'm going to talk a little bit about the stems on this plant. They're, they're a little bit flattish like goosegrass, but goosegrass is much more conspicuous and it's more silvery and it's chunkier flat stems. 
Another distinctive characteristic is that this does not root at the nodes like crabgrass does. A node is where a leaf um, in, attaches to the stem. In crabgrass, the stems bend down and the roots form and it will colonize a large area spreading out like a crab. Dallas grass, like goosegrass, does not root at the nodes and that's a key ID feature. A little more about the stems. We talked about it having rhizomes. Rhizomes and stolons are modified types of stems. This plant has no stolons, so it's not going to have the above ground runners like you would see on Bermuda grass and um, zoysia grass. But it does have the underground rhizomes, again, that form those clumps. Those rhizomes are what makes this plant really tenacious and hard to kill. Those rhizomes store carbohydrates. I'll talk about that a little bit more later, but I just wanted to plant that fact in your mind now. I'm going to talk about the leaves a little bit. This was harvested yesterday, so I am losing a little bit of my show and tell here. But the leaves, here's one, has a prominent midrib. If you want to pan in on that, Alex, you can maybe see it. Much more prominent um, by the midrib, that's that center rib in the middle of the leaf. I can see it there on the screen. Thank you so much. That really separates it from goosegrass. And they're coarse, they're prominent, just about the same color as crabgrass and goosegrass as well. So look for those midribs. Now when we get to the flower, that's a lot more of a distinguishing um, aspect. I've brought a flower in with me and also a picture. Thank you for showing that. The racemes are also called fingers. In that picture, you see four racemes. You see that they alternate along the stem and they culminate in one terminal raceme. Usually they're in pairs um, of two to 10. I see a lot of two. Um, it seems to vary by patch. The patch where I dug what's in my hand all had two racemes. This patch where I took the picture all had four. Another distinguishing, so what I'm going to talk a little bit about Bahay grass before I forget. Bahay looks exactly the same in terms of those seeds, those black seeds. I've heard them re referred to as poppy seeds. They're not poppies, but they look like poppies in, in their color and in their, their small round shape. And Bahay has a V shaped. If you want to cut back to me and what I'm holding. So by V, I mean like that. It's a terminal V on the top of the stem. Um, we also talked about, um, yeah, so these have the, the dancing alternating back and forth racemes. Both have black poppies. But this, is very, this makes it very easy to tell the difference looking at that. These seeds are it's something incredible to mow your lawn and then miss a few days. It rapidly goes to seed. So if you are, you need to mow and you decide to take a nap instead or to do a, something else um, worthwhile, this can go to seed behind your back in just a matter of days. So you'll see your lawn, perhaps it just is two days late in mowing, maybe three. This plant will shoot up and go to flower in that amount of time. It's absolutely stunning. And it is what makes this an incredibly um, prolific weed. That was a little hint about our mowing section, how important it is to keep mowing regularly if, if you have weed infec infec uh, infestations. <laughs> it is a type of infection, isn't it? Um, I'm gonna talk a little bit about the life cycle about the plant. It is not an annual. Every other weed we've covered so far in the weed of the month has been an annual. That means it goes to seed, it, form, it germinates, forms a, a mass, a biomass, and then goes to seed with, within a, a year, a certain time. It could be months actually, but they call it an annual. Dallas grass is a perennial grass. It's a plant that was introduced to the United States as a forage crop. And we talked about the weeds and, um, I'm sorry, the seeds, and that's what spread this throughout. It loves full sun. It's 
going to grow in full sun. You're not really going to see it in much shade at all. Maybe some partial shade, but it needs a lot of sun. We talked too about the wet areas, commonly seen in ditches. And since it loves low-lying areas so much, it also tolerates compacted soils very well. There are many plants that do that, that can come out of our swamps um, and be grown very um, successfully in compacted soils. Two examples you'll see every time you go to a mall or to a strip mall are red maples. Red maples grow in low-lying areas, river bottoms, even in swampy areas, yet is fully adaptable to the dry, harsh conditions of our parking lots because they're adaptable to low oxygen conditions. It's just as harsh in a wet area as it is in a compacted parking lot. Weeds like these and many plants we desire, such as the red maple, proliferate in compacted soils as well. It is a forage crop that we talked about. I believe it is still grown. I see many articles online about how to successfully grow this as a forage crop for your livestock. It is not suitable for all livestock, and I am not an expert in that, but if you're interested in that, that is something you will have to research yourself. Certainly, Farmer Dallas had a great time growing this weed for his livestock. I, I'm going to go in how to prevent this, this voracious plant, <laughs> voracious in terms of eating up a lot of real estate. We talk every week about pre-emergent. Pre-emergent will work as well in inhibiting more seeds from germinating. This is one that will germinate in the winter. So this would be your February pre-emergent application here in the Southeast. However, pre-emergent prevents weeds from germinating. It will not kill existing plants. So if you already have an infestation, large population, the pre-emergent will not kill it. It will come back next year. And that's important th an important thing to learn about and understand about its life cycle. It can be a little bit hard to grasp, but observe it and um, keep thinking it and studying. We talk all the time about the pre-emergent life cycle and when you need to apply. Greg was talking about in September for the winter weeds and all the summer weeds, it would be February. So just a little reminder about that. Mulching, of course, helps with all weeds. Mulch your flower beds, mulch your veggie beds. This is a weed in a lot of crops as well. And of course, you can always correct your soils. If you have a low-lying area of your yard that all, you know pools up, we've had a lot of rain, you, you certainly know where those areas are by now, and you have a Dallas grass infestation, you can kill it out. And if you maybe if your neighbor still has Dallas grass and you want to prevent the weeds from them blowing into your gar garden and your yard and germinating, correct that soil. Bring in topsoil, bring in good quality soil so that water no longer stands in that area. Or correct your drainage issue, or you know, you might need to do both in tandem to get that water running away from that low spot or going towards a ditch. Um, and improve that soil with compost. That might help as well, because we talked about how it loves the poor soils and the compacted soils. Compost improves com compaction. Now, one of our, you know, besides the pre-emergent, we also talk a lot about the manual methods. And this is no exception. However, <laughs> it is so tenacious. It doesn't look like much, this root system here in this picture, but it is, hard to pull up by hand and something this small even I could not dig up. So I brought my shovel and this is one of my favorite tools. I've had this shovel for 15 years at least. You can sell it's much loved and beat up. It's um, I think you can google it by calling by searching the term radius shovel but it has these great um, step plates here. They're not small. They're nice and wide. They're more comfortable on my feet. It's also got a steel shaft through here that is, it's, I've snapped a few of the wooden shovels. This holds up great and also has this great grip handle that's just super easy for me to grip. I don't have to be so precise about just gripping the end, but you'll need a shovel to dig this up. And we talk a lot about hand weeding with the family. 
well, you can shovel weed with a family. Just get those kids out there, teach them good shoveling skills. It's a lifelong skill. It's great for weeding. It's great for learning how to plant trees, teach them how to dig a great, great hole, and um, great for learning how to vegetable garden and getting your sod laid too. So lifelong skill there, not just hand weeding. Um, shovel skills are important as well. And also mowing. Mowing with this is an interesting. So it, um, the forage crop website I was reading says, make sure you mow above three inches because under three inches, this, this forage crop won't respond well. And that tells me a little bit something that if I am keeping consistently mowing my lawn, my lawn I mow at two inches. If I keep it consistent, don't let it get away from me, um, I'll be mowing this before it goes to flower like we talked about. Now I have read conflicting information that talks about how this is responding to lower mow heights and that's a little bit troubling but also it tells you just keep mowing regularly, keep mowing regularly. And what I mean by responding to low mow heights, and you might have seen it in Poa Annua and some other weeds, is they just start flowering when they're shorter. And <laughs> that's a little bit threatening to me. Um, keep consistently mowing is the takeaway from that. Also, time and patience. That's our other uh, manual, that's under the manual category because it might take you uh, several, several years of pre-emergence, several years of digging and consistent mowing over the several years to really combat the weed population in your lawn and great lawns aren't made overnight it does take patience it might take a couple of years to turn it around and even um all myself when i made laid a new lawn two two years ago it took a couple of years to really get this weed control in this weed population in control so just want to encourage you to set realistic expectations for combating weeds it does take several years and the last option is the chemical option, and it is also tricky with this with Dallas grass, and that goes back to the topic of the rhizomes. The rhizomes store carbohydrates, so when you spray an herbicide on this plant, those carbohydrates, the, the plant has stores of energy in the rhizomes, and it will grow back. Um, Greg pointed out that the first application will probably just yellow the plant and keep at it. And I wanna cover that a little bit more. Stuck um, a PDF that was given to me by um, Brandon Eubanks, who was the host of the Lawn Tips Live last month. He's the farm manager in middle Georgia. And he gave me this great flyer from Texas A&M Extension. It's called Dallas Grass in Turf Grass. You can Google that, but we also have it linked in our blog. Um, towards the bottom. We have some links to some other resources, but I want to read a quote here because it's, it's pretty interesting. It says, most herbicides only claim Dallas grass suppression. Um, I'm sorry, I didn't read that right. Most herbicides only claim Dallas grass suppression on the label. However, most of these products will provide some control if multiple applications are properly timed. And that's to encourage you, again, with the time and patience. This article recommends two applications in the fall and a third in the spring. So you're gonna need some patience when you're spraying out. Also, a key point is that this is embedded in your lawn and you're gonna to have to use a non-selective herbicide on it. That means it will kill part of your lawn. There are a couple tricks to deal with that. One is using cardboard. This is what I do because this is a gently breezy day, but herbicide will, will spray and drift onto your lawn, other areas of your lawn and damage it. Use a large piece of cardboard, just take a box, recycle it, um, break it down so you can use it as a shield when you're spraying and prevent any drift. I've also heard people taking um, pipes. They take a pipe and they spray down into the pipe um, so that they're preventing any drift and they're localizing that spray. Also, Greg has a favorite tool and it's basically like a tank with a stick and a, a wand on the end. If you can envision an oil lamp, 
the wick and oil lamp that's kind of like that and you can then just brush the herbicide on these big coarse leaves that are up above your lawn maybe put a barrier down maybe put that cardboard down but then you can just target that plant and not kill your lawn and when you you kill out this plant you'll obviously you've you've seen how big it is it will kill out a patch of your lawn warm season grasses will grow back in if it's not too big of a patch spread some compost water it extra it will grow back in very quickly also we sell single rolls if you have a larger patch and this does happen if you, each roll covers 10 square feet just come by and get a couple of rolls and if you've got that bare dirt after you've sprayed it out get that grass back on and cover it cover that bare dirt so more weeds don't germinate there again I'm done with my everything I know about Dallas grass. Mm -hmm.